Chapter 2 In Dreams Begins Responsibilities Her mind held to no bounds, and like a leaf in a hurricane, she was waiting to be taken far or torn apart. Jaden Nadim, Global Science Press, in regards to quantum computing. Scene 1. Hank Mosley. The most memorable days had always started out in the most mundane ways. With eyes dreary from the summer sun and morning nights, Hank Mosley returned to school for his eighth year. His head pounded like a thrown-out-of-place axle rod. His engine was in no shape for function, and if the check light of his eyes did not indicate anything wrong, his dozing head did. He rested his head for moments before lecturing Locklear skipped introductions and plunged straight into the lesson. If everyone can, please pull out your syllabus for this year's curriculum. The first hour of the day will be spent teaching history, and a good day to you too. Locklear continued her droning as Hank slipped into and out of moments of awareness, such as the point-no-point treaty, so on and so forth, she spoke, only pausing in her own speech to ask a question. With that being said, is anyone familiar with this town's history? Perhaps where the name Tenenact comes from? Hank, who would win Jeopardy if given a chance, would have, under any other circumstance, been thrilled to jump in and show what random factoids he could spurt out. Between Hank, Greg, Uncle Tyler, and their father, the family were naturals in regards to trivia. Now, however... Hank began to wonder if Father Sandman had left to grab a pack of cigarettes from the store, never to return. So, Hank ignored the question for Alyssa, the brain, shown to answer instead. Though plenty competent, Hank was not a grade-A student. He could be, if he had applied himself to his full potential, but... In perfect gentleness, Hank just didn't care much for curriculum. Consequently, Hank learned like a baby, with his hands and mouth, yearning for understanding and wonder. Instead, he made up for what he lacked in scholastics and character. Hank followed the scout law to the T, from trustworthy to reverent and God-fearing can I get an amen congregation. He was a renaissance man with the consideration of Gandhi. Above all other things, he was reliable with his word. Do you have something that needs a fixin'? Hank can solve the problem in no time. Hank was always a problem solver and fixer. He carried an inventor's heart and knew a great knowledge and knew that some things did not need to be fixed, but instead understood and looked at from all possible angles. Hank noticed the clean hand of Alyssa Schoen popping up to answer Locklear's inquiry. Has she always worn that nail polish? He didn't precisely fancy Alyssa. His liking for her, he would come to realize later in his life, was due to three simple facts. He was a boy while she was a girl. And she occasionally talked to him. It was nice. Tenane Act, founded in 1889, is a Yakima word based in the Sahaptan dialect, meaning sunset. The town is named from how the sun sets between the Cascade Range, Glacier Point, and Mount Baker, and to give homage to the natives, of course. Her voice was autonomous and with the information generated at high speeds, Alyssa could put Siri to the test. Good. Though her voice didn't seem to think as much. Tenenact is the Yakama word for sunset. Alyssa frowned at her own subtle mispronunciation. 
My ancestors traveled the wilderness in this region, farming fish before colonization took over. They would build pit homes made from skinned animals and cattail fibers for the harsher winters. We will spend the first six weeks. The room in front of Hank slowly began to sink as the floor below him shot skyward. His face hit the desk with a large kaplunk, turning all eyes toward him. It didn't matter how hard the desk was. It was as if Hank had been lying on Egyptian cotton. Now he was alone, drifting and almost, but not quite, dreaming. No reason to fall asleep in my class, Mr. Mosley. If I catch you dozing off, you will not have your chair for the rest of the day. Understood? He nodded his head. Yes, ma'am. That goes for all the class. Locklear roared coolly in demand for order, sweeping a pointing finger and squinting her eyes in only the way teachers and parents can. Understand. The class whizzed a forced positive groaning response and a dolefully exaggerated, Yes, ma'am. Good. As I was saying... Hank's eyes could no longer hold their own. Hank, you cannot... A loud ring filled the small room's atmosphere. The static rung, buzzed, cracked, thundered? Into his ears from the phone's intercon system. If I can even start teaching today, that is. Locklear paused her lesson, sighed, and rolled her eyes before picking up the phone. Yes? She clicked her tongue, but Hank knew she was hoping others would just bite their own. Then, Hank noticed something strange. What was once a stern, don't-take-no-excuse face of a teacher shifted into something more capable of emotion. Her eyes grew wide and horrendously empty as they locked Hank's own. He's... She paused, almost seeming to hold back something. Here. The class was staring at her in a waiting silence. Yes, he's here. Pause. Yes, I can send him down. The students' heads had begun to turn like spoiled milk. Each gossiped about a possible offender and the offense committed to warrant a call from the office. The class awaited, ready to see who would be called out. What did you do this time, Richard? Alyssa whispered in a prudish, I'm better than you, attitude. Richie Floss shrugged his shoulders and, equally hostile, and probably with honesty, said, Could be a list of things, brain. Hank Mosley? Pack your things, you'll be leaving for the day. The day, he thought to himself. As was ritual, the class turned to face his direction with longing jealousy. Alyssa protested the gawking by facing forward with her hands clasped on her dress. Man, Jordan Lear was shaking his head. Leaving early on the first day? Lucky SOB, Mosley. Though he didn't feel lucky. But he stood up boldly, grabbed his things, and began to leave. For whatever reason, he was going to go for the day. But fortune did not favor the brave. Hey, four eyes, you almost forgot this. Hank turned to face the closed fist of Dustin Green, a sight he was used to seeing in the halls or parking lots after class. Hank reached out for what he assumed would be school supplies. Instead, he had been greeted a wet blob that was unmistakably chewed gum. He opened up his hand and flung it in disgust. The gum shimmered of bright pink with bits of torn meat peppered within it. Sickness had seized his body and collected in his throat. He held firm and swallowed. None of that nonsense in my class, Mr. Green.
Hank, here's some sanitizer and napkins. Dustin, I need you to sign this referral. I will not tolerate any horseplay or bullying. Hank sneered at Dustin, something he would come to regret later, and grabbed several napkins with a pandemic's worth of hand sanitizer. Mrs. Locklear scribbled an office pass to which Hank thanked her. Silent halls followed Hank as he sauntered to the office with no hurry in mind. His school was built on the foundation of one long corridor, and although it had been empty at this moment, he felt eyes staring into his soul, watching him as his chest grew heavy. He was too tired to hurry, so he continued blissfully, ignorant of the coming day. He was too tired to even think, why had his father taken him out for the day? was a thought that never arrived at the terminal. Instead, he thanked the opportunity for shut-eye. Soon, a pair of voices joined the silence, one soft and as tired as Hank felt, the other of a highly energetic child. "'Can I stay? I want to stay!' the child whispered. "'I'm sorry, kiddo, but... There's something important I need to tell you, and... The broken man spotted his eldest child and gave him the most horrible smile one could witness. Hank. The Mosleys gathered into their old station wagon. Hank took notice of the sheriff's truck parked in front. Some will say it is impossible to ever feel lonely in the presence of others. But as the car remained silent, so had each to their own thoughts. As they pulled out of the lot, the world around them grew rich in ozone and filled the ground with a thick mist. Silent, unsure of what was happening, all had refused to speak. Not even Greg would make an utterance. So, Hank watched out the window, catching glimpses of the outside and his reflection. He looked ahead to see the old water tower and wondered if the inside of it looked just as rusted and crusted. Hank's father had told him that the town had voted to replace the building, but funding had not been met. At another, there was talk that a local painter would make it look presentable, but the weather had not been favorable. Past the tower and the east, Smooth mountain peaks rolled over one another, forming the Kettle Mountain Range. The mountains were stacked high, unblemished by the touch of snow for the season. Thick greens bearded the mountainsides, dancing in the wide summer winds. If one followed the range north, they would find Republic, Tananak's sister town. Every year, the two municipalities came together to hold a festival in remembrance of the old mining company, a fantastic tale made to be saved for another time. The car stopped in a small parking lot next to the Little League field. The smell of cheap grease and hearty meat filled Hank's nostrils and his mouth in drool. Mr. Mosley put his arm around Hank's seat and turned to face Greg. I hope neither of you hasn't had lunch. It was ten till eleven, and what Hank's father had asked was a loaded question. But it was needed to ease the news to come next. The brothers smiled for the last time they would for the day and shook their heads. Gregory had been pumping his fist into the air with anticipation. This was the place the brothers had loved outside of their own homes. This place would always soften the blow when fallen under tough times. That was when Hank stopped smiling. Joe's was not only favorable to the Mosleys. As much as Hank knew, the steak burgers were rated the best in the county. Both locals and out-of-town travelers 
would enjoy the masterpiece that was the original Joe. Joe Fisher repurchased the lot in the 50s and passed the store to his son Walker in the early 2000s after he retired. Even in retirement, Hank could remember eating with his family, including his aunt and uncle. The pair would occasionally see old Joe wheel on by in his highly talked about electric chair. He was the type of old man that could make anyone laugh with a crazy story. He also knew and gave a lot of advice. In every conversation Joe had participated in, he would give his two cents worth. But all good times fall to an end, and in the future, the memory of oneself seems to fade. Joe had died in the late summer of 2011 after a severe fall into dementia. They hadn't been to the store since. But... Hank was glad to change that. He was happy to get the sour taste of Joe's passing out of his mouth. So, he and the family hopped out of the car, dodging the rain that started to fall. When they walked in, the once cozy booths and bars had been replaced with round tables and wooden chairs. The red and blue color scheme was now a dark blue trim with white pearl walls. Danny Jinn and Joseph Higgins had greeted them when they walked into the shack. Danny had been their server and ran the register, while Mr. Higgins cooked the orders in the back. How's it going, Mosley's? Danny asked with a cheerful smile. They answered with the typical pleasantries while returning their own and asked Danny how his summer was. It's been real. I got to go down to Miami with the family, and we rented a condo. I'm thinking about applying to the university soon. That's good for you, Danny. Hank could tell his father was forcing a cheerful smile. He looked into his father's eyes. He had been crying. What can I get you all started with today? Vanilla milkshake, please, Hank said. Oh, me too. Greg wore puppy dog eyes as he turned to his father. Please? Their father rolled his eyes and grinned, and for the first time, there was a natural shine about it. Fine, but you two are sharing. Danny, could you make it a large? He gave the boy a wink. He had really been spoiling them. What had his father been waiting to tell him? Sure thing, Mr. Mosley. And what will you be drinking? Water will be fine. Danny returned with their drinks and asked what they would like for lunch. The two boys settled with the original Joe. Hank ordered it as it came, while Greg with jalapenos. The reason why the boy had tasted such hot foods remained a mystery to Hank. Mr. Mosley ordered a basket of table fries and nothing else. That's when Hank's father began to reveal his cards. I have bad news. He began to choke up. The table waited in silence until their food came. Hank wanted to give his father time to tell him of the trouble. Meanwhile, Greg had rubbed his back, informing him that he loved him oh so very much. Their father returned the sympathy. As the food arrived, the table reluctantly began to eat. About halfway through the meal, Mr. Mosley spoke up. Never had food turned rotten so quickly. Scene 2. Savannah Offerto The girl sat in the field, her legs stretched out as she extended her chest like a bellowing bridge to the sky. It was filled with swirls of gray and black wisps of loose cotton. Rain was soon to fall. Today was the day she always came to hate Savannah's detest 
was for one reason alone. This was the day her father was to return back into town. Robert Aferdo was a deceiver with two lust. One towards a handle of liquor to grab a grip on his wasted life, and the other towards the one he called his daughter. He hadn't always been this way, or at least never showed this side of him until the accidents. Ever since her mother passed, ever since Roger, something changed inside her father. A door inside of him had opened, letting the monster out of the closet. Soon, Robert would return to town with wages to spend. And spend it he would, always loyal to his favorite watering hole, Fox's Den. She prayed many times for the day the alcohol would finish him, whether slowly through its poisoning or tragically in an accident. An accident. This is what Savannah had cried for. But in reality, she knew that she needed him. She needed him for equity. God forbid She got thrown into the system at the ripened age of 17. She hated to admit it, but she needed him. The rain began to trickle down anchors. With laughter, she raised her arms and fell back into the soft fescues below. The wind was mild for the time being. It was cool to the touch, scratching at her longing itches. For mere moments, she could pretend. It was not the first day of her last year in school, and her father would not be home tonight. Nope. Instead, it was Sunday morning. Her mother and Roger joined her to enjoy this lovely spring weather with a picnic. She dared not think about college and the challenges it could protest. No, Savannah had lain in the field, laughing like a child. She was full of giggles, and with no apparent reason coming to mind. She watched the sky above her and imagined the clouds as shapes. Thunder cracked the sky, sending down the entire bucket Her hair clumped to the backs of her dress, sagging to her waist. She stood up and wiped the mud off her calves and bottom. She looked over toward the tall pine where her book bag sat and shrieked. Water puddled around the bag, soaking it to the touch. Inside the bag was her escape, her freedom to worlds beyond. Though... The bag was no portal or a relic enchanted by ancients of long ago. It could certainly be seen as such. She opened the satchel and pulled out her borrowed copy of Melville's Moby Dick. Like the blue whale, the book remained with integrity throughout its pages. She thanked the higher powers, whomever they might be, and supposed she faced the truth that it was time to go to school. She was still over a mile away from the building, and roughly a few hours late. But what would they do? It's not like when she arrived, they would turn her away. Instead, they would give her a slap on the wrist with a Don't do that again, Missy, or You are too smart of a girl to play hooky, Savannah. Whatever. Of course, they would call her father, who may or may not answer, who may or may not even be home to punish her. God, she hoped for the latter. She liked the quiet she found during the summer break, as she had preferred the company of characters these days. Archetypes, rather than the gray she came to know in the world. She was tired of loving people. They either tended not to reciprocate her love, or left her entirely. In the end, one thing remained consistent. 
heartbreak. At least in her books, she could return to the pages with a newly changed perspective. In life, however, the choice was concrete. She supposed this to be the case for any constant readers like herself, but would she feel the same if she were a character? An archetype? How would she think to find out her life was dictated by some creative type sitting in their undergarments, typing away the illusion of choice? These were the questions that always came to the girl in the field. Savannah never considered herself the religious type, though the prospect of a higher being or God would not surprise her. She hated whomever it may be. Hated it for taking her mother and her brother and leaving her stuck in this guarded tower a feverish dragon's domain. She wanted to escape it. She tried to go through the story and start a new one. Yet, Rapunzel's hair had been cut short and Samson fell into Delilah's temptation. This was her last year and to Nanact, and she was beyond ready to leave. She wanted to get out of the mountains, to a place with flat plains and golden sunsets. She thought east of Washington, possibly in the Midwest, or somewhere like New York City. She had been unsure, but she did enjoy reading, and Broadway. If she compelled herself to dream... That was the gig right there, an editor's role. But this hopeless romantic was too scared to attempt such fates. At the instant of drowning, she invoked the three sisters. It was a mistake, an aberration to cry out for life everlasting. As she walked down the road, suffocating such thoughts, the speeding truck of Sheriff Morrison flicked on its lights. She stopped to let it pass her in the street, waving him off with a smile. The vehicle came to a skid, and the window rolled down. The sheriff looked up at the rain and inspected the sky. Savannah, it's a bit wet out, don't you think? He said. She put her wrists together and began walking towards his truck. Taking me in, Sheriff? He looked at her for a moment. Damn right, you're too smart to play hooky on the first day of school. <sighs> Verbatim, she laughed. Ver he began confused. Never mind. He pointed a stern finger at her and chuckled softly. Your father already gives me enough trouble during the day. Just please do your part and go to class. Hop on up front. Why not the back? She asked him dryly. It's admission to guilt, man, to be frank. Reserved for your father. Now, come on. He opened up the passenger side and cocked his head towards the sky. I suppose it's the sign of the end of summer. She stood there with reluctance. Savannah, I don't have all day. He rolled his eyes at her. Please, hurry up. It's already been a crazy morning. She walked into the cab and sniffed a faint wash of brandy. Ready, partner? He asked kindly. She nodded as she clicked the seat belt. The sheriff drove her down the block and into the school lot. Inside the lot was a silenced ambulance, lights still flashing, the paramedics had been loading someone onto a stretcher. Next to it was a constable talking with the school groundskeeper, Mrs. White. Savannah thought to ask Morrison about the incident and figured out two things. One, it was none of her business to ask him. And two, the information would be given if it became relevant. Not curious about what's going on? Morrison, clearly uncomfortable by her silence, asked. 
Savannah shrugged as his truck came to the foyer. Okay, then. He spoke and wrapped his fingers across the wheel. Bye, she said with a smile. He returned the excellent favor. You have a good one, you hear? Savannah did hear and gave him an okie-dokie with her fingers as she left his truck. Now secured along the shoulder strap, her book bag swayed from her attempts to dodge the rain. She burst through the office doors, causing Mrs. Wynne to crumble the local longacre. Mrs. Wynne conducted herself and grabbed a tardy sheet from a large pile Savannah had planned to chip away from in the coming year. Late? She looked up from the paper and at Savannah, who was still dripping. And wet. Savannah stood with her arms to her sides and looked down at her feet and back up. Mrs. Wynne had handed a pen to her. She took it and signed the dotted line, stating how oh so very sorry she was, and that she understood absences would not be tolerated. Whatever. The office doors opened as she handed the paper back to Mrs. Wynne. Mrs. Lim, the school principal, was with the officer she had not recognized. Molly White walked in behind them with tears in her eyes. The groundskeeper was shocked while the other two tried to conduct her. Debbie, could you make Molly tea from the break room? Chamomile, maybe? Savannah looked back over to Mrs. Wynne. Of course, she said. Now seated, Mrs. White blew an extensive collection of snot into the tissue and nodded. Mrs. Wynne, slightly repulsed, gave her an okay before returning back to Savannah. Go on to class, Alfredo. She left the office, turned her head back for one final moment, and walked down the hall. She reached to the last door she would come to know in the building and paused before entering the class. Gregory Mosley had been walking down the hallway past her in tandem with a teacher's aide. He was smiling and as happy as could be. Never let that smile fade, Gregory, she thought. Hello, Gregory. How are you today? She asked the boy with a mouthful of smiles. Leaving. He then ran down the hall, full sprint with his hands waving up in the air. Miss Johnson chased the boy, calling for him to slow down. Daddy! He said as he flew into the arms of Adam Mosley. Hi, Savannah. He looked sad. She didn't have time to ask him why. Instead, she returned the hello with a smile and wave before stepping through the door into the unknown. Scene 3. Bob Morrison Time could not cure eternal longing, and time and time again, Morrison longed for the drink. Timeless, endless, he found himself in the company of of Beth. Want another? Nothing ever happens in a small town. He said this phrase repeatedly in his head. Yet, nothing had changed. And after this, Tyler was a good man, an honest one. So yeah, I'll take another if you don't mind it, Beth. Tyler Maston was found rung to a kettlebell, tossed into the bottom of the pool or at least the image in his head had kept him there, rotting, bloating. Molly, poor, sweet Molly, had been the one to find him. She had told Morrison and Officer Trevino she hadn't believed in what she saw. Then, all at once, boom, it hit, and she realized she was looking at a dead man. Bradley Moore ran in with a barbell after hearing her screams. He was just floating there, just beneath the surface. That is what he told Morrison, and what Morrison told Beth. 
she leaned in across the bar and hushed her voice. Was it a murder? She filled his pint. It's what we supposed, Morrison said before raising his eyebrow. But then we saw the tapes. Recordings? She asked plain-faced. He nodded and took a sip. One man went in, no man came out. He looked like shit. Word is, he suffered from chronic insomnia. It means you can't sleep. She frowned at him. I know what insomnia is. Just so happens I've been dealing with it my whole life. Why do you think I own and run my own bar? He laughed, licked the beer off his mustache, and said, Cause your daddy left it to you. She laughed lightly and said, I suppose I could have sold it. Insomnia, though. That's some rough stuff. Really plays with your brain. What's your trick? He asked. What? To treat it? I just keep myself busy. I don't think of sleep, and eventually... She jested with her hand as if to say, I sleep. So, what did the tape show? Can I ask that? Morrison shrugged his shoulders. Don't suppose why not? It's getting out sooner or later. Suicide. Still, doctors are going to run an autopsy. But it's a simple case, really. I... The grip of old, salt-stung hands grabbed Morrison's shoulders. Chiff! Beth rolled her eyes as Robert Offerto pulled up to the bar. It's been a minute, hasn't it? How's my girl doing? Morrison shrugged Offerto's hands off his shoulders. I'm a sheriff, not a chief. Haven't you been by to see her yet? Alfredo bellowed like it was the funniest joke he had heard. You got it. Robert shot a finger gun towards Morrison. Sheriff. Sure Have you been here long, Rob? Morrison asked. He shook his head. Just pulled into town. Right, Morrison said. You're giving Beth your keys, all right? Rob slammed his hands onto the bar. Bullshit! He exclaimed with laughter. Morrison glared at the fool. Easy, chief. Here you go, Bev. He handed the barkeeper his keys, while neither the sheriff nor Beth corrected him. Rob? Robbie, is that you? Morrison turned around and saw Tweedledee's dumb. Daryl Floss, a local plumber. What's happening, D'Lo? Alfredo said with a shark smile. Ah, you know, the boys and I figured you'd be stopping by tonight. We're sure as shit glad to have you back. Morrison dropped his ear away and turned to Beth. I'll take my leave. Thank you, dear. Beth frowned and called him a bastard. Don't worry, dear. By the looks of things... I'll be back. And by the time the boys had been singing rye whiskey, he was. If the ocean were whiskey and I were a duck, I'd swim to the bottom and give one big suck. But the ocean's not whiskey. Nor I am a duck, so I'll sit here and drink until I'm fucked up. And by God, they were. <laughs>